All right, some additional problems for chapter five. So here I have a merry-go-round. It's rotating around its center, kind of like that. And here I have a child who's sitting a distance of 1.2 meters from the center of it. And I know that she has a linear velocity of 1.1 meters per second. I'm asked for her centripetal acceleration and the force, given her mass. So it's pretty straightforward. The centrifugal acceleration is going to be equal to the linear velocity squared divided by the radius, or 1.1 squared divided by 1.2. So we're going to get 1.008 meters per second squared. So that's the acceleration. The force is equal to the mass times the radial acceleration. I'll also you know, kind of point out here that the force and the acceleration are in um, the center pointing direction, so it's going to be towards the center of the merry-go-round. So 22.5 is her mass, multiplied by 1.008 meters per second squared, and I'm going to come up with 22.7 newtons for my force. For problem number nine, we have a car that's going around a turn, it's got some radius, and I know the coefficient of friction, and I'm asked for how fast can the car around this 90 meter turn. So here's going to be my poorly drawn, drawn car, and we're kind of looking at, at it head on, and we're going to say the car is going to turn towards the right side of the screen. So let me go ahead and draw my free body diagram for this car. I'm going to have its mass times gravity in the downwards direction going to have the normal force in the upwards direction, and I'm going to have the force of friction, which is essentially what's causing the car, the car to turn. So if I say, okay, we do the sum of forces in the y direction, the car is not falling through the road, it's not accelerating in that direction, so I'm going to have the normal force um, in the upwards direction and mass times gravity in the downwards direction, so you know, much as you'd expect, the normal force is equal to mass times gravity. Now if I do my sum of the forces in the x direction, the car is accelerating. The car is going to be accelerating in that direction right there. So that's going to be equal to the car's mass multiplied by its acceleration. What are the forces? Well, the only force we have is the force of friction right here. So the mass of the car times acceleration must be equal to the force of friction. And we also know something about this. We know that acceleration is going to be the centripetal or radial acceleration. So I can say mass times velocity squared divided by the radius must be equal to the force of friction. So I'm going to divide both sides by mass as such. I'm going to multiply both sides by radius as such. And you can see over here, my radius is going to cancel out, my mass is going to cancel out. If I take the square root of both sides, I can isolate my velocity. So I can say, all right, my velocity is going to be equal to the square root of the force of friction multiplied by the radius divided by the mass. Now, I know that my force of friction is going to be equal to mu sub k or mu sub s, which in this case is going to be static friction, multiplied by the normal force normal force is going to be equal to mass times gravity, so mu sub s multiplied by mass multiplied by gravity. So I'm going to take that and put that into the equation right here. Velocity is going to be equal to mu sub s, mass, gravity, radius, divided by mass. And we see, lo and behold, mass is going to cancel out. So Finally, I'm left with the velocity of the car is going to depend on the coefficient of static friction multiplied by the radius multiplied by gravity. And I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to plug all these values in. So 0 0.65 that was given to me. I know the radius of the curve is going to be 90, 90 meters. Of course, I know gravity is going to be my old friend 9.8 meters per second squared. And it turns out that our velocity is going to be equal to 23.94 meters per second. Lastly, I can also see that it is um, independent of the mass of the car. Okay, so here we have a Ferris wheel, and uh, we know it's
it's got a diameter of 25 meters, that tells me that the radius is going to be 12.5 meters. Be careful, the book always likes to do that to you. We want it to be working in uh, radius. So let me just go ahead and say, let me draw a free body diagram for these people right here. In the Ferris wheel, they're going to have their weight in downwards direction, and then they're going to have the seat pushing up on them, so normal force due to the seat. We're going to feel weightless when the seat's not pushing up on us anymore. So the normal force will be equal to zero. That's when we're going to feel weightless. So if I say, well, actually, I'm going to first draw my acceleration. My acceleration is going to be downwards here. We're going to be falling. Right Newton's second law, sum of forces, some forces in the y direction is going to be equal to the mass multiplied by the acceleration. That's going to be equal to the normal force going upwards minus the mass times gravity. Something that I can't forget is my acceleration is in the downwards direction. Mass times gravity is in the downwards direction. So my acceleration is going to be in the negative direction right here. So this guy is going to go to zero. We want to feel weightless. And the masses are going to cancel out. And also the negative signs, they're going to cancel out. We're going to divide both sides by negative one. And we're left with the acceleration must be equal to gravity. Now this is going to be the radial acceleration. We know that the radial acceleration is just going to be v squared divided by the radius. That's going to be equal to g. I'm going to multiply both sides by radius. Take the square root of both sides. Everything's going to cancel out on this side. And I'm left with the velocity is equal to the square root of g multiplied by the radius or the square root of 9.8 multiplied by 12.5 meters. So I know the linear velocity must be equal to 11.07 meters per second. However, it's asking me for the answer in revolutions per minute. And I know that the period is going to be how long it takes to do one full revolution, and the frequency is going to be one divided by the period, or how many revolutions per minute. So really I'm looking for the frequency. I can relate the velocity to the period, 2 pi r divided by period, and use this equation right here to say that's going to be 2 pi radius multiplied by frequency. So I can finally write my frequency is going to be equal to my linear velocity divided by 2 pi radius. So that's going to be 11.07 meters per second. And then that's going to be frequency. That's going to be the um, time for one revolution. And we're going to divide that by 2 pi multiplied by 12.5. And I'm going to put units in for this, for this time. So we can see that the meters are going to cancel out. And if I just leave it as stated, this is going to be in revolutions per second. It asked me for revolutions per minute. So I need to say, OK, there's going to be 60 seconds in one minute. Now I have everything I need such that my seconds is going to cancel out. I'm going to be left with an answer in revolutions per minute. So at the end of the day, my frequency is going to be 8.457 revolutions per minute, or RPM, if you will. For number 19, I have a sports car that's kind of coming over a big hill. We all know that it's good fun to drive over hills at fast speeds because we, f we feel um, well, almost weightless depending on how fast you go. So here I have a hill. I know what the radius is, 88 meters. I know how fast the car is traveling, so I'm going to have some velocity that's 18 meters per second. If I draw all the forces on this guy, we're always going to have, this is going to be the car um, plus the driver. We're going to have the mass and gravity downwards. And of course, we have the normal force in the upwards direction. This is the supporting force of the road. And I always just like to draw my acceleration on here. So the car is going to be accelerating downwards. It's going to be you know, going down. It's not going to be going up. So what we can do is we can say, OK, I'm going to write Newton's second law. Some of the forces in the y direction must be equal to the mass of the car plus the driver uh, multiplied by their acceleration and that's going to be equal to the 
normal force in the upwards direction, minus mass times gravity. Again, acceleration and mass times gravity are in the downward direction, so I've got to put a negative sign in front of my acceleration. And I simply add mass times gravity to both sides, and I get what the normal force must be. That's going to be equal to um, mass times gravity minus mass times acceleration. So I'm going to factor out a mass right here, let's say gravity minus acceleration. I know that, that acceleration is going to be the centripetal acceleration, so it's going to be v squared divided by r. So mass, gravity minus v squared divided by r. And we can see that the normal force of the road is going to be equal to the mass of the car plus the driver. And you're essentially subtracting off the velocity squared divided by the radius of the curve. Um, you know, if you go faster and faster and faster, you're going to subtract off more and more and more. You're going to feel less. Um, you're going, to, you're going to feel more weightless. Your normal force will become closer and closer and closer to zero. So we're asked for what the normal force is given the situation. So I'm simply going to plug, plug these guys in. The mass is going to be 975 kilograms. That's the car plus the driver. I'm going to have my gravity, 9.8 meters per second squared. I know the car is traveling at 18 meters per second. I'm going to square that. And I know the radius of the curve is going to be 88 meters. So I can find out that the normal force of the road on the car is going to be 5965.2 newtons. I can derive the same exact expression for the force of the uh, driver on the car. However, the mass is going to be different. Now we're looking at a mass of 62 kilograms. And it's going to be the same thing, 9.8 minus 18 squared divided by 88. And I'm going to come up with 379 newtons, much less than the 608 newton weight of the driver. So now I'm asked in part C, so this is going to be A, B, and part C, I'm asked when is the normal force equal to zero. Obviously if you drive the car fast enough, then we can get a normal force of zero. So that's going to be mass multiplied by gravity minus velocity squared divided by radius. I can divide both sides by mass. It's going to go away. Divide zero by mass. I can solve for the velocity. I'm going to add velocity squared multiplied by radius to both sides, and then multiply by radius, take the square root. And I'm going to end up with the velocity is equal to the square root of g multiplied by the radius. So the velocity is going to be equal to the square root of 9.8 right there. Radius of the curve is going to be 88 meters. Take the square root of that guy and we're going to come up with 29.4 meters per second. So for number 32 we're starting to get into Newton's law of gravitation. I'm going to say okay here's the earth. It's got some radius radius of Earth, it's got some mass. I know that the, I can write the gravitational constant to be equal to big G multiplied by mass of the planet divided by the radius of the planet. It's going to be squared. In the case of Earth, I replace the planet by the mass of Earth and the radius by the radius of Earth. So now we're going to have some new planet, and I know that the radius is going to be twice the radius of the Earth, the mass is going to be the same. So gravity on this planet is going to be equal to jig big G multiplied by the mass of the Earth, and now it's going to be two times the radius of the Earth, all that's going to be squared. So if I made, made these guys here to be equal to Earth, and I replace the P by E, you can see here I have big G, mass of the Earth, divided by 4, radius of the Earth, squared. So this is simply going to be little g of Earth divided by 4, or 9.8 meters per second squared, divided by 4. We're going to come out with 2.5 meters per second squared is going to be equal to g on the planet. Okay, now let's get a little practice using Newton's law of gravitation. 
So I'm going to have four spheres. Draw these guys. One, two, three, and four. They all have the same mass. I'll call that M. And they're all separated by some distance D. Now, this distance of separation is not going to be little d. I'm going to call that big D. So how, what forces I'm going to feel? Well, I'm going to feel, let's just pick this guy right here and say what are the forces of the other three on him. I'm going to feel some force in the y direction. I'm going to feel some force in the x direction. And then I'm going to also feel some force in this diagonal direction due to this guy right over here. So we can say the force in the y is going to be equal to big G, mass of the one, mass of the other. It's just going to be mass squared divided by the distance squared. You can also say that the force in the x is going to look much the same. Big G, mass of one, mass of the other, divided by the d distance of separation between them squared. Now the diagonal component, well, that's going to be force diagonal, that's going to be equal to big G, mass of one, mass of the other. Now I have this distance of separation squared between them, and we can look at the triangle that we have. It's going to be big D, that's going to be little d, that's going to be little d. So the Pythagorean theorem says that d squared is going to be equal to d squared plus d squared over 2d squared. So big G mass of one, mass of the other, divided by 2d squared. Now, I want to break the diagonal force up into its x and y components. So force diagonal in the y, that's going to be equal to force diagonal multiplied by the sine of the angle in between them. That's going to be a 45 degree triangle. So that's going to be the force diagonal multiplied by square root of 2 over 2. And similarly, the force diagonal in the x, that's going to be equal to the force diagonal multiplied by cosine of 45, which is also going to be force diagonal multiplied by the square root of 2 divided by 2. Now I say, okay, well, what are the sum of the forces in the y direction? Well, that's going to be the force in the y plus the force diagonal in the y. So that's going to be big G, mass of, or I'm just going to say mass squared now, divided by the distance squared. That's the force in the y. And then I'm going to say big G, mass squared, divided by 2 D squared, multiplied by the square root of 2, divided by 2. Which we can simplify by pulling out a G, mass squared, and then D squared. And we're left with 1 plus square root of 2 divided by 4. Now it's a simple matter of plugging it in. Say the net force in the y direction is going to be equal to 6.67 times 10th negative 11th multiplied by the mass squared, 0 0.75. Divide that guy by the distance of separation squared, 0 0.8 quantity squared. Then 1 plus the square root of 2 divided by 4. And we're going to end up with 7.93 times 10th and negative 11th newtons. Now, we can just see by similarity that the force in the x direction is actually going to have all the same components. So 7.93 times 10 to the negative 11 newtons, only the directions are going to be different. Now, we can find out what the net force is. Net force is going to be the square, or the, the square of of the two of them, so net force is going to be f uh, the magnitude of this guy. So fx squared plus fy squared, take the square root, and we're going to get the net force. So that's just going to be 2 times 7.93 times 10 to the negative 11th newtons. And we're going to come out with 1.1 times 10 to the negative 8th newtons, and it's going to be at 45 degrees just based on the similarity, or just based on the symmetry of the problem. And before I let you go, I forgot to square that guy. Number 46 is actually pretty simple. We're looking for the speed of a 
the satellite, then we know from example 512 they derive the speed of a satellite to be equal to the square root of big G, the mass of the body that is orbiting, as well as the radius. The trick to this particular problem is to recognize that um, here it gives us the height of the object above Earth's surface, which is very different than the radius. So here I've drawn Earth. Now we have the radius of the Earth, and it's telling us the height of the satellites. There's my little tiny satellite guy. This little tiny r is going to be equal to the radius of the Earth plus the height of the satellite. So now it's a simple matter of just plugging everything in. The object that we're orbiting is going to be the Earth. So it's going to be big G multiplied by the mass of the Earth, which we can look up. And now it's going to be the radius of the Earth plus the height. Extend that guy down just a little bit. So we know what big G is, 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11th. We can look up the mass of the Earth, 5.98 times 10 to the 24th kilograms. And the radius of the Earth, we can look that up as well, 6.38 times 10 to the 6 meters. And it tells us that we're looking at 4,800 kilometers. So that tells us <coughs> that the height is 4.8 times 10 to the 6 meters. We need to make sure everything's in the same units. 4.8 times 10 to the 6 meters, and we can calculate out our velocity to be 5.97 times 10 to the 3, and this is going to be in meters per second. Okay, last problem is going to deal with an astronaut, and this astronaut's going to be circling around the moon. So this box is going to represent my astronaut, and I'm going to assume that there is some type of platform he's strapped into that's going to be able to provide a normal force on this astronaut. So this astronaut is going to feel a gravitational pull towards the moon, and I'm looking for his apparent weight, which is going to be the normal force. So what I can do is I can say, well, for part A, we're moving at a constant velocity, so if I write the sum of the forces in the y direction that are acting on that astronaut, it's going to be zero, no acceleration, constant velocity. So we're going to have normal force in the upwards direction, force of gravity in the downwards direction. So we can say that the normal force must be equal to the force due to gravity, which is going to be equal to big G, mass of the astronaut, mass of the moon, divided by their distance of separation squared. We're given the distance of separation. Keep in mind it's in kilometers, not in meters. It needs to be in meters. 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11th. That's the gravitational constant g. Mass of the astronaut, 75 kilometers, or kilograms. We can look up the mass of the moon, 7.4 times 10 to the 22nd kilograms. Distance of separation, make sure we convert that into meters, 2.5 times 10 to the 6. And very common that people forget to square that. So we can get the normal force is equal to 59.23 newtons. So that's part A. Now for part B, we're going to say that there's going to be an acceleration. It's going to be towards the moon. So on my diagram over here, I'll add in my acceleration. Same thing as before, some forces is going in the y direction. It's going to be mass times acceleration. Acceleration is downward, I'm going to call that negative. And then I'm going to ha again have the normal force upwards, and then the force of gravity, or force due to gravitation downwards. I'm solving for the grav or solving for the normal force, the force acting on him by his by the uh, spacecraft or his apparent weight. So normal force is going to be equal to the force of gravitation minus the mass times the acceleration. Now this force of gravitation, I've actually just solved this guy up here so I can be lazy and just rewrite this guy. 
59.23 newtons minus the mass times the acceleration of the astronaut and I can get his apparent weight now is going to be negative 76 newtons what the negative means is it's going to be towards the moon or better yet I drew my arrow wrong I uh, should have drawn my normal force in that direction so what's really happened is you know, he's kind of strapped in and the spacecraft is yanking him towards the moon in this option up here I drew it in the correct direction and so the normal force was away from the moon